This video is sponsored by Squarespace. With the climax of the Egghead arc quickly approaching in the manga, I find it amazing that Oda keeps finding ways to surprise us. Like, for example, Dorian Brogy just showed up to Egghead, which I don't think a lot of people expected, but you start to see what Oda's cooking as soon as you remember that Egghead is the island of the future, and we originally met those two on the island of the past, which was Little Garden. In fact, they even helped us depart that island by blowing a hole through a giant goldfish. So helping us depart this island sure makes a lot of sense. And on top of that, we should also have Vivi meeting up with the crew at some point soon with Morgans, and she was at Little Garden with us when Dorian Brogy first ever spoke of Elbaf, which we know is our next island. But you know, adding two brand new players like this to the altercation also just adds to the ever-growing list of things that many of us want answers for by the end of Egghead. Like, what about this incident is gonna shock the world? Do Vegapunk or his satellites even make it out alive? What happens to Punk Records, or the Fusion Reactor, or York, or the Seraphim? Will Kuma and Bonnie be okay? Is Kizaru flipping sides? Is Dragon still looking east? And maybe my favorite question of all is what is Blackbeard's goal on this island? Since we are getting so close to the climax of this arc, I wanted to try taking a stab at answering every single one of these questions because, well, on one hand, I thought it'd be fun, but also because, ironically, I think Oda's actually shown his hand a little bit with what he set up outside of Egghead. Because we know Oda is amazing at world building. It's probably one of the biggest reasons that we all love One Piece. And when he decides to show us something going on in the world away from what our crew's doing in a given arc, it's usually because it will have major ramifications on what the crew is doing later on. I think a perfect example of this is how, during Wano, we saw the Warlord system get abolished. And by doing so, it caused the Cross Guild to form in the background during Wano, and then that allowed Buggy to take over the final Emperor spot after the raid on Onigashima. And you know, one of the most unique things about the Egghead arc is about how how half of it takes place in areas other than Egghead. Like with Shanks beating Kid, Blackbeard defeating Law, Garp saving Kobe, the Mother Flame attack, and even Weevil being taken by Green Bull. Because Bakken said that Vegapunk was the man who could prove that was Whitebeard's child. Oda showed us these things now because they're gonna tie back in after Egghead is over. So I guess what I'm really saying is, if we want to know what will happen in Egghead, we first need to consider what's set up outside of Egghead. And there's probably no better place to start this discussion than with Marshall D. Teach. Because this man has been making big moves ever since Wano ended. Namely capturing Pudding, going to Amazon Lily for Boa's fruit, fighting Law at Winter Island, and then his crew defeated Garp at Hachi Nosu. But in chapter 1079, we also saw Blackbeard's ship arriving to Egghead. Now, this panel is from a day before the present day. It's been at least a night since then. So because of that and the distance to Winter Island, I doubt Teach himself was on that ship. And as many people pointed out by now, it's most likely Lafitte and Katarina Devon, as they were not present on any other island we saw the Blackbeard Pirates recently on. Now, Augur could maybe warp Teach and the gang over eventually. If not with one giant warp, it could maybe be a bunch of smaller warps. But as for who's there right now, it's not likely to be him or even Teach. But the question still is, what is their goal here, and when is Oda finally going to have them do something? Well, let's first consider what Teach learned at Amazon Lily, because that incident occurred multiple weeks before now. So whatever he learned there could have influenced this overall plan that he's put into place since. And obviously, the reason he even went to Amazon Lily was to get Boa's fruit, which he didn't ultimately get, of course. But while he was there, he did meet the Seraphim. And he even noted that they had the PX symbol, meaning that they were the government's new pacifista. And wouldn't you know it, one of the Seraphim just happens to use Boa's fruit via green blood. It's almost too convenient for Blackbeard. I almost almost wonder if Oda created the Seraphim for the explicit purpose of Blackbeard getting those fruit abilities that he needs without requiring him to actually kill those characters. I mean, like we saw with S. Shark and Senor Pink, you can literally take those powers without needing to kill the person. So I think getting S. Snake is the obvious first thing Blackbeard wants from Egghead. Like I said, he's had weeks to plan for it now, so it all just makes sense to me. But I think in addition to that, he at least needs someone who can command the Seraphim. Otherwise, it's kind of useless, and he probably needs whatever other Seraphim are needed for his overall plan. So I think the most obvious candidate here to help him command the Seraphim is York. I mean, York is already the traitor, and now that the Buster Call is imminent, it seems to imply that her deal with the government is off. She's probably going to need a way out somehow, and Blackbeard's crew seems like a pretty good option. Not just to command the Seraphim, but even to make additional Seraphim potentially, or maybe even more importantly, to make green blood for even more Devil Fruits. I mean, this would give Blackbeard 
Blackbeard even more fruit users under his control for whatever his big plan is. But as we've heard several times from Vegapunk already, the biggest holdup with making these creations is money. That's basically why he worked from the government from the beginning, because they had the money to fund his projects. But Blackbeard just happened to get a hold of Monkey D. Garp, who is worth 3 billion from the Cross Guild compared to Kobe's 500 million. If he sells Garp, then he has more than enough money to fund York's projects. And now maybe you might be thinking that Garp should instead be used as leverage for Blackbeard to maybe become a king like he mentioned to Kobe, since, you know, Garp is the legendary hero of the Marines and all. But remember, Sengoku told us that the government has wanted to get rid of Garp for a while now, mainly because he doesn't listen to anyone, but his notoriety makes him hard to get rid of. So I honestly think that if Garp was a hostage or something, I doubt the government would offer that much in return for him. They'd probably rather let Blackbeard take out Garp and look like the bad guy so that people hate pirates even more and then support the government even more. So overall, I think the 3 billion is a better deal for Teach, which is thankfully a hell of a lot more than you need to try out the sponsor for today's video, Squarespace. Because if you're anything like me, then whenever you have to do pretty much anything, you probably look for the easiest way possible to do it. And that goes double for making websites. But the beautiful part about Squarespace is that not only is it extremely easy to use, but you can also create beautiful websites while doing it. And this all kind of starts with their Fluid Engine, which lets you start by choosing a template, where you can then customize tons of different details by basically just dragging and dropping, and this even includes like setting up a store or collecting email subscribers for a campaign. I made my own website a few weeks ago in literally less than an hour, and now you're actually watching me update this website to basically promote the video that you're watching right now. Honestly, all of this is so intuitive that you're going to get the hang of it as soon as you get started. And if you head to squarespace.com right now, you can even even get a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your website, just make sure to go to squarespace.com slash daksake for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring, but let's get back to the video. So if Blackbeard really does sell Garp, then I think it's also important to consider what it means for the Cross Guild, which would probably be further proving to the world the threat they truly are. We saw this developing already with T-Bone, RIP by the way, but if some low-ranking Marines saw that the Cross Guild had Garp turned in, none of them would probably feel safe. I wonder if a lot of them will start resigning, maybe. So Garp ending up there just makes a lot of sense. But going back to Blackbeard, one thing about York is she kind of needs to be a package deal with Punk Records, because that's Vegapunk's brain. I'm sure she's pretty capable on her own and everything, but she's able to tap into Punk Records and should almost be stellar level by using it while making new creations. I mean, even Saturn made that one of his goals alongside York. And it honestly makes double sense they'd want Punk Records because they also have Pudding, whose devil fruit powers allow her to access people's memories. I understand a lot of people believe he got Pudding for her third eye, since if it awakens, it supposedly lets her read the Poneglyphs, but as Big Mom pointed out, that hasn't happened yet. That's why she wanted Nico Robin. And since Blackbeard is a devil fruit hunter primarily, I would not be surprised if the fruit power is really what he needed with Pudding, because by virtue of Punk Records being Vegapunk's brain, she should be able to access it, and those memories come out almost like a film reel, basically, so Teach should be able to look at those himself. Maybe this will let him learn some of the Void History research Vegapunk was working on. I mean, one of Blackbeard's hobbies is historical research, and Oda said that in real life, Teach would be an archaeologist. And if it's not anything about the Void History that he wants, then maybe it's something about the Buccaneers, or just about how Devil Fruits work in general. Perhaps he believes that Vegapunk has the answer for one of his next upgrades that he has planned. You also just have to think how perfect it would be for Punk Records to end up on Hachinosu, given that it has a giant skull on it. I'm not sure if it's big enough to hold Punk Records inside since it's like massive, but if it could, that would be amazing. And if they did that, I wonder if Pizarro merging with the island would have some type of extra effect on him. But you know, speaking of that, how would Blackbeard even get Punk Records to Hachinosu safely anyway? I mean, on one hand, maybe Augur could do it with his warping powers, but again, he shouldn't be on the island right now, so let's just say that's not an option. So I think the next next best guess is actually S-Bear, because he has access to the Paw Paw Fruit abilities. Honestly, if they get a hold of S-Bear, they could have themselves all pawed over to Hachinosu safely after they get what they want. I mean, we know there are a lot of parallels between Saba Odi and Egghead already, so I think it would be kind of cool if it was capped off with S-Bear pawing the Blackbeard Pirates away to somewhat invert the Straw Hats being pawed away by Kuma. And I think there's a really good tie to pudding here as well, because we saw that the Paw Paw Fruit can also push out memories. And now these memories act as a copy instead of how Pudding kind of has 
to remove the original one. The reason why I think this is going to matter is because a lot of us expect the Big Mom Pirates, or Katakuri specifically, to come after Pudding. If that actually happens, which I also do expect, then Blackbeard can just use S-Bear to basically replace Pudding's powers almost. Now obviously this would only work if it's true that they wanted Pudding for the powers and not the third eye, but still. And this would also keep with the theme I've been talking about, that the Seraphim are almost replacements for the fruits that Blackbeard needs. And I think the plot relevance of doing this sort of switch up is that Pudding would then be aware of Blackbeard's plan, or at least probably, or at least part of it or something. I mean, they wanted her for a reason, so she might have a clue why, right? And then her being saved by Katakuri eventually could then lead them back to the Straw Hats, because maybe something she learned from Blackbeard is really important, and they need to go tell them, or she just needs to go tell Sanji specifically, or something. Or maybe this at least gives them a reason to go to Elbaf so that Big Mom also goes there, because I think a lot of us expect that she'll be there. And if there was any other Seraphim that I think Blackbeard eventually gets, I think it would have to be S. Gecko, or at least that's what I'm calling Moria Seraphim until further notice. And the reason why is he already showed interest in getting Moria, but it seems like Moria refused to join. And it also seems as if he escaped Hachinosu because of this panel we saw with Perona. We didn't see them at all after that, so it's not confirmed or anything, but since Kobe ended up being freed, I think it's safe to assume he took that deal. So in a very similar vein to S. Snake, S. Gecko could give Teach access to Moria's powers without needing to kill or kidnap him. Like I said, I genuinely wonder if this is why Oda thought of the Seraphim in the first place. And between the shadow powers as well as York's expertise, I'd wonder if this is Blackbeard's segue into getting his own army, or like an equivalent to the Grand Fleet basically. Because most major pirates do have something like that. Shanks has all those weaker pirates under him that we saw at Elbaf, Whitebeard had tons of pirates that showed up to Marineford, Buggy has fans all over the world, Big Mom's family is massive, Kaido had all those gifters and stuff, etc. So I think it makes sense for Teach to get his own army at some point as well, and it wouldn't surprise me if Blackbeard got the most deadly one out of all of them. Like, genuine question, what constitutes a corpse for the purpose of a shadow fruit? Does a pacifist account? Can York just make like inanimate seraphim that S. Gecko adds shadows to? I mean, I would have to imagine that it's anything that doesn't have the 21 grams of soul anymore that we learned about earlier in Egghead. So I think like a cyborg type body should work as far as the shadows are concerned. I mean, imagine an entire army of like zombie seraphim with varying devil fruit powers from the green blood. Or even if they were just regular pacifista, like the Mark III or something, that would still be terrifying. But if Blackbeard walks away with York, Punk Records, and some seraphim, then what is the government getting? I mean, they came in with the express purpose of killing Vegapunk and then also trying to acquire three things. York, Punk Records, and the Power Source. So given what I said about Blackbeard, all this theoretically leaves for them is killing Vegapunk or getting the Power Source. And between those two, I think the Power Source is far more likely. And the main reason is just that it's needed for the Mother Flame. That weapon is probably the number one most dangerous piece of tech involved at Egghead in general. So as long as the government keeps that, then the loss here for them is somewhat tolerable, I think. Because this would still let them erase whatever islands they wanted, which is pretty dangerous powerful. But what's interesting is that we haven't actually seen the power source yet, nor have we even seen the Mother Flame itself, which I did do a video on that before and it still holds up extremely well, so I'll leave a link to that one down below, but as for the power station, we just know that it's on the island somewhere, and that Rob Lucci relayed its location to Kizaru, so somehow he found it, even before he started fighting Zoro. So my suspicion is that it's going to be found deep underneath Egghead Island, and the first reason for this is that it's kind of the only place that makes sense because we've seen so much of the island at this point. I mean, the basement where York killed Shaka and kept the Cypher Pole agents is the basement of the Labo phase, like the upper part with punk records that sits up on the cloud. But I think the power source is going to be in the basement of the actual island itself, because I don't think that's been explored at all yet. Now, maybe it could be even lower than that Labo phase basement as well, like deep, deep within the clouds, but I don't think that makes sense either. Since it's a fusion reactor, it's something you'd want to keep as safe and stationary as possible. And the basement of the literal island would help with that a lot more than anything else. Like, one of the biggest things that's considered when building a nuclear power plant in real life is how earthquake prone the area is. And if it still has to be built in that area, then they put in a lot of measures to kind of mitigate any catastrophe. And this kind of makes sense for the story of One Piece as well, because we have a buster call going on right now. The power station would probably be the one thing that's safe from all those explosions if it truly is deep underground. I mean, if the books at Ohara survive just by being 
put in a lake, then hopefully an underground bunker area for the power source would be all right too. Because if this was all true, then it makes even more sense that the government's going to end up with it. Because if it's deep enough to survive the Buster Call, then it would still be there for them to retrieve afterward. And on top of that, it also kind of inherently implies that it would be hard for anyone else to move. It's kind of like I spoke about with S-Bear pawing away Punk Records, except with that one, Punk Records is kind of just sitting up in the sky asking to be pawed away. I mean, the entire Labo phase could if they wanted to. But if there's something deep underground, that's probably going to be a lot harder to use those powers on. And like I was just saying, fusion reactors aren't the type of thing that you'd want to send flying across the world and expect a good result, so the government ending up with it after the Buster Call is just the simplest answer, I think. But now, without York and Punk Records, it remains to be seen how the government would replicate the Mother Flame. But given that Saturn is a quote-unquote man of science, although a somewhat questionable one after not noticing Vegapunk's deception, I think he could figure it out somehow. I mean, he was responsible for launching the first Mother Flame, so I wouldn't be surprised if he could make another one. But now, with that being said, what's going to happen with the government's biggest goal of all, which was eliminating Vegapunk? Well, the first question that we need to answer about that is, if Vegapunk did die, what happens to Punk Records? Because his literal brain is inside. I mean, shouldn't it shut down at least on some level if his body is done for? And furthermore, his brain grew to that huge size because of the brain brain fruit. When he passes away, his body is going to lose the fruit, right? What happens to his giant brain then? Does it revert back to normal? I mean, since Saturn wanted to both kill Vegapunk and also take Punk Records at the same time, that sort of inherently implies that he knows it'll be okay even after Vegapunk's dead. But I don't know, like I just said, Saturn's been fooled before when he said he wouldn't be, so I'm not exactly sure how that would go down. But if I had to take a guess, I think the most likely answer here is that while Vegapunk's physical, you know, biological brain is inside Punk Records, it's probably more of like a cyborg brain situation at this point. So, you know, people can still retrieve information from it just like the internet, basically, even if Vegapunk himself dies at some point. And if this is true, what an amazing connection that would be to Einstein. Now, we already know that Einstein connects to Vegapunk because of the tongue sticking out and just the general genius factor. But get this, when Einstein died, they took out his brain within seven and a half hours of his death. But afterward, it was actually split up into several different pieces, and they were each sent to leading pathologists around the world so that they could study it. So if we take that thing one step further, what if Punk Records is also split up to different people around the world? Now, this could happen with or without Vegapunk's death, since, you know, his brain is already separated from his body. So let's say that instead of just Blackbeard getting Punk Records, as I said before, maybe they do split it up somehow, and Blackbeard could get a piece, the government could get a piece, maybe Neo Mads even gets a piece, and the Straw Hats could just keep Stella himself because his antenna lets him connect to it. That way, they all kind of have the same information, but each have different ways to connect to it. And if you like that idea at all, then you should really go check out this theory that Randy Troy and I came up with over on his channel called Reassemble Joy Boy. I'll put a link down below for you guys. It's a pretty similar idea to what I just said, except instead, it involves the Poneglyphs. But now, when I say Vegapunk is going to live, that may surprise some of you, given that we just saw Vegapunk get donutted. But you know, I'd be a lot more worried about that if he didn't give an entire speech about Sun God Nika directly afterward. We all know that Oda doesn't kill his characters off very often, but when he does, he tends to set it up and let us live in that sadness way more than we did here. He usually makes a death scene feel like a death scene. I mean, sometimes he makes it feel like a death scene and the person doesn't even die. But this one kind of almost felt like the oh no anyway meme, but in manga form. I mean, Saturn stabbed him and like two or three panels later, people come over to help Vegapunk and Saturn's just gone. And he just let them sit there kind of talking about Nika the whole time. You know, I get that Oda has to let people cook sometimes, but I mean, compare this to when Akainu punched Ace. Because right after that, he went in for a second punch immediately. Like, honestly, Kinemon got a more conclusive death scene than this, and he's not even dead. Same goes for Pell. If Vegapunk is gonna die, it's not because of that stab that we just saw. Now, is it Chopper that's gonna save him? Is a satellite going to? Is Bonnie gonna change his age or something to save him? I don't really have those specific answers, other than the fact that Oda will find a way as he always does. And then another good reason why Vegapunk has to live is the OG Miss Buckingham Stussy. Like I said at the beginning, she said that Vegapunk specifically was the man who could prove Weevil was Whitebeard's kid, especially because Bakken's clone, the CP0 Stussy, helped him out at Egghead. And she's pretty injured right now, and maybe she doesn't make it out, and that could even tie in another way. Like, imagine that Stussy does die during Egghead, and then Vegapunk has to go explain that to Bakken himself. Now, I don't know how she'd feel about it exactly, but that storyline alone is kind of crucial. I mean, even if Stussy lives, I am kind of worried what the government's gonna do to her since she betrayed them as a part of CP0. I mean, if you go back to the raid on Odigashima, there was a scene before Gear 5th happened 
where Drake stabbed Guernica and told him that he was pursuing his own sense of justice. And then Guernica replied, I envy you. As if almost to say that he couldn't do the same thing. But Stussy did chase her own sense of justice there, obviously. So that could be important going forward if Stussy doesn't escape with everyone. But as for Bakken, it's also important to figure out this Weevil stuff since Green Bull took him in. In fact, out of all the warlords that got chased down after the dissolution from the Reverie, he was the only one captured by the Marines. That has to lead somewhere, I think. And my guess is that it's going to tie to the Cross Guild, because they already have a lot of past warlords on their crew. And now while Weevil is a newer one, I bet you that Weevil is also going to go to Impel Down, conveniently where Mr. Two and Doflamingo also are. Two people that many expect to join the Cross Guild someday, since, you know, Doflamingo is an ex-warlord that we defeated just like the other ones in Cross Guild, and also Croc has Mr. One and Mr. Three back. So I think it's finally time to go get our goat Bond Clay. I actually want to do a full video on this in the future, so you know, I'd highly recommend subscribing if you haven't already, but for now, it's a really fun idea to think about. And I also think that this could all tie to the man marked by flames. Now, I'm going to put another link below to this video because it's going to provide a lot more context if you're curious, but the main thing here is that Whitebeard probably has a tie to that missing Poneglyph because it's the one from Fishman Island. He held that territory for most of the Great Pirate Era, and Bakken said she specifically wanted Whitebeard's inheritance. That's why Weevil being Whitebeard's actual kid is kind of a big deal, and also why it's so ironic that she's saying all this to Marco, who was also very much Whitebeard's son and his first division commander at that. Even if Weevil is Whitebeard's son, he's not going to be any more of a son than Marco is, so it's not like that inheritance is going to belong to him. But regardless, I wonder if the reason that Oda is even bringing up this inheritance in this way is because the road Poneglyph was a part of it since Whitebeard held that territory for so long. And now maybe Bakken knows that, and that's why she wants it. So tying this all back to Vegapunk, because of this Weevil situation, I doubt that Stella's going to die, because he's going to have the most information on this. And if I had to pick one more reason why the Stella's going to live, I think that if Blackbeard gets York and Punk records, then keeping Vegapunk around the Straw Hats would act as somewhat of an equalizer. Because, you know, York and Punk records with all of the money that Blackbeard's going to have is probably about equal to Frankie and Vegapunk, assuming they don't have that much money to blow. Because in both situations, you have one person who's kind of the builder, which is York and Frankie, and then one who has the information, which would be Punk records and Vegapunk. Now, obviously, Vegapunk can build stuff too, but I think you get what I'm talking about. And on top of that, you know, Frankie and York even have similar dress codes, so that would be kind of cool. And by keeping Vegapunk on the ship, it would not only let them keep pace with Blackbeard and whatever upgrades he's getting, but it would also let Frankie start making all the crazy upgrades that we've been waiting for, whether to himself or the Sunny. And furthermore, if Vegapunk joins us in the Elbaf arc, then he will get to see the giants that he saw from Ohara. He'll also get to share and learn new information about the Void Century, and maybe even reveal important information about Sun God Nika, or Luffy's fruit specifically. I'm kind of dying for Vegapunk to do a quick test on Luffy to see if he learns anything about his devil fruit. Like, maybe that it's not actually a zone, as I've been preaching for a while, or just some other kind of important information. I mean, if it is a zone fruit, then he could kind of duplicate it, right? Now, I'm not saying he will, but if it's a zone, then I'm not saying he wouldn't try. But all right, if Vegapunk doesn't die, what about Saturn? I think one of the most popular theories I've heard regarding the end of Egghead is whether something is going to happen to Saturn. And personally, I don't think he's going to die just yet. And the main reason for this is I don't know if we've ever had a major character like Saturn lose right after their full introduction. Like imagine Kaido losing after revealing his dragon form in Act 1 of Wano or something like that. And the Gorosei are quite literally some of the endgame villains of the entire series. We've waited like 20 years to see them finally go into action. And yes, we are in the final saga, of course, but we aren't in the final fights portion of it yet. And by Saturn surviving all of the insanity at Egghead and displaying his regeneration powers and such, it would only show how serious of a threat the Gorosei truly are. Now, obviously, if everything else goes down at Egghead, as I describe in this video, though, he will be in some major trouble with Emu. Like, the Marines will have been decimated, Vegapunk is still able to share that Void Century information, more people will know of Nika, they didn't get York and Punk records, etc. Emu will probably not be pleased with any of that. So if Saturn were to die at any point soon, I would rather that Emu kill him for his failures than Saturn actually getting defeated by anyone at Egghead. Because this would just kind of show how strong the top brass of the government truly is. Like, if we can't take out Saturn, but then Emu does, then we know Emu is an even bigger threat than we already think they are. But I do think something interesting that could happen, though, is somebody finds Saturn's human body back on the ship. Because his form on Egghead was summoned with a summoning circle. That is not a transformation like we've ever seen before for a zone, or for any 
anything really. Brook's time skip is the only time we've seen something like that. And if you go back even earlier in the Egghead arc, there's still this mystery panel with the shadowy figure that Shaka saw destroying a camera. And I've been saying for literally almost a year now that that thing looks like Saturn, or at least as close to Saturn as you can get in a silhouette. And if that's true, maybe he's just astral projecting or shadow projecting his way to the island. And maybe we can learn a little bit about that if somebody were to go find his normal human body still back on the ship. I mean, maybe Katarina Devon can even go copy his body because of that. Now, we don't know how her powers work exactly, but I mean, that would be a good opportunity if she does have to touch him like Mr. Two had to. Or maybe she even goes a step further and just kidnaps him. Now, that seems a little bit too extreme for me. You know, they just got Garp, so kidnapping Saturn on top of that would be kind of ridiculous. But either way, I just think it'd be really cool if his human body was still back on the ship and somehow Oda tied us back to it. But now let's talk about Kizaru, because I know everyone has been talking about him potentially switching sides and abandoning the Marines. This kind of started with Luffy getting the food since one of the ramen bowls looks like Kizaru's from earlier in the arc. And there's also the whole thing that Luffy randomly went missing and was over by the food machine. But the biggest key to me for all of this is really just the setup of the OG3 admirals, because Akainu went on to become Fleet Admiral, Aokiji moved on to become a pirate under a Yonko, but Kizaru has stayed in his very same position. He never took that next step and pursued his true will or sense of justice like the other two, which is unclear justice. I mean, that already tells us right there that this man is kind of complicated. So if I had to say right now whether Kizaru is flipping or not, I would say that he will eventually, but probably not officially during this arc. I think it's more likely that Egghead is going to be to Kizaru what Ohara was to Aokiji. Like, this event is going to plant the seed of betrayal for later on. So that means that there may be no full betrayal yet or full departure from the Marines, but maybe he'll just do one or two things here or there that help the good guys because he's realizing how wrong everything the government's doing is. I mean, think about it. He's been forced to kill his friends. He's even said he doesn't want to do that. He knows Nika is back, who he knows because of those very same friends. And all of this suffering on Egghead is specifically because the government doesn't like Vegapunk researching history. Not because of the technology, not because of the weapons, not because of the duplicate fruit failure, none of the actually dangerous stuff. It was only because of the void history. It's like when Saul was asking Sengoku what the Ohara researchers did wrong. They did nothing wrong except study something that was going to make the government look bad. And on some level, I'm sure that Kizaru knew this already. I mean, he's been working for the government for quite a while, but experiencing all of this firsthand might affect him greatly. Maybe him helping Luffy secretly with the food is going to be his equivalent to Aokiji letting Robin escape Ohara, where he doesn't totally betray the Marines, but he helps them in secret and then just makes up his mind later on. And honestly, I think out of everything, the biggest thing affecting Kizaru has to be the confirmation that Nika has returned, because he probably knows the legends of Nika very well from spending his time with Kuma and Vegapunk. I mean, Kuma told Vegapunk he thought Luffy would be Nika, and while we don't know if Kizaru heard that line specifically, he and Saturn both did hear their agreement to save Bonnie in the first place, so it wouldn't surprise me if they heard that as well. And I mean, we saw Kizaru do the Nika dance, which is still huge in my opinion, so if he was ever going to stop being a quote-unquote cog in the machine, I think it would only be because he found a better machine. I mean, the fact Kizaru even feels that way at all kind of implies how big or threatening the machine he works for is, and Nika might be the one person who could change that. And you know, it's one thing to kind of hear the legends of Nika, to do the dance, to hear the sounds, to hear the dangers of it from the government, but it's another thing to get rocked by a white star gun the way that Kizaru did. He got to fight Nika and experience firsthand what that's like, which would give him a very clear idea of how strong he truly is. That is probably the clearest proof of whether Nika can change the world or not. And you know, it wasn't until right after that punch happened that we saw the food appear, and that we saw Luffy disappear. So maybe that punch convinced Kizaru to do just enough to let the Straw Hats escape without blowing his cover. But if or when he ultimately does flip, whether it is now or maybe sometime in the future, I do not think that Kizaru would join the Straw Hats, even as an ally or something. Now maybe he would help them escape here, sure, but I think he's a much better fit for the revolutionaries, because it would make it so the OG3 admirals went to the three separate factions. Akainu is still with the marines, of course, Aokiji went with the pirates, and then Kizaru could maybe go with the revolutionaries. And given Kuma's and Vegapunk's close connections to them, it all just kind of makes sense, I think. And if Kizaru is going to betray the government, it might make some kind of sense to join the guys directly trying to defeat the government, because obviously Kizaru would be a very wanted man. And I think this whole idea that Egghead is to Kizaru is what Ohara was to Aokiji is a great time to discuss the next part of this whole thing, which is what will shock the world. It's kind of a unique thing in One Piece to be told ahead of time that this incident 
incident will shock the world, and then we get to see it happen afterward. Because we're all kind of sitting here waiting, like, what is this big thing that we're waiting for that the whole world is going to be shocked about? And I think a really good place to start here is if you go and look at the O'Hara incident and maybe just kind of think, what would have been the most shocking possible thing for the world to learn from this? The first answer you're probably going to think of is the Ancient Kingdom name. That's why they shot Clover when they did. And obviously, Clover has close ties to both Robin and Vegapunk. So when it comes to Egghead, sure, the incident part will be like the Buster Call, the deaths that happened, the island blowing up, whatever. But the part that shocks the world has to be something especially crazy. And what better thing than having the Ancient Kingdom name revealed and right to Agorisei's face instead of over the Den Den Mushi. And I think out of everyone, Robin and Vegapunk both make the most sense to reveal it. And now maybe Robin a little bit more so just because she could finish what Clover started and she's from O'Hara and everything. And then obviously for it to actually shock the whole world, then everyone around the world would need to hear what that name was. So I think the answer for that is probably Big News Morgans. He could either go put it in the paper for the next day, or he could just broadcast the event to the world in real time. Sort of like the events at Marineford, which I think would be fair to say shocked the world since Whitebeard died and they all heard the One Piece was real. And as we've heard a few times during this arc, the will of O'Hara lives on. So by revealing that name during this arc and getting the crew out safely, it would be further proof that that was true. And if we're going to talk about the name of the Ancient Kingdom, then what better segue would there be than the giant robot that's literally from that very kingdom? The one who has woken up twice now to the sounds of Luffy's drums. The last time this giant moved was 200 years ago, when it attacked Marijua around the time of the Fishman Rights Movement. You could probably make some parallels to Kuma here, because, you know, he's also a cyborg, and he just climbed the red line earlier in this arc, and that makes even more sense now that Kuma's actually here on Egghead. And even in chapter 1106, we can see that he and the ancient robot both look somewhat similar while seeing or hearing Luffy in Gear 5th. And I think before we try guessing what the robot's going to do here on Egghead, we should first think about what it was doing 200 years ago in Marijua. Because since it happened around the time the Fishmen were about to join the Reverie, it seemed to be a reason why the Fishmen didn't get to rejoin the Reverie until just recently. And my theory for why the robot did that has always been that it was protecting Poseidon. Because it's incredibly risky to take Poseidon that far away from the sea and the sea kings. We kind of even saw that at the most recent reverie where Shirahoshi was almost captured twice. But now if that is true, then we need to ask how it woke up in the first place back then. And I have three potential answers for this. One is that it was just on some kind of timer. Because, you know, when Odin went to Laugh Tale, he seemed to learn that in specifically 20 years, Wano was going to be saved. So maybe the ancient kingdom could see the future or something. And then option two would be that someone back then had a tone dial with the sounds of the drums of liberation. I love this idea the most probably, but the question would then be, who the hell would have such a thing and how would they get it? This would kind of be a parallel to Brooke who has a tone dial with his crew playing Bink Sake that he's saving for Laboon. And Laboon's like a friend that's been waiting around a long time, so that kind of ties to the robot a little bit, I guess. So that would be kind of cool. And then option three is kind of similar to that, which would be that someone actually just played a tune very close to the drums of liberation and then that also worked. Like maybe they used actual drums and not the Nika fruit or whatever. But now that the robot has woken up for the second time today, what is it going to do? Well, the first option is that it just replaces the Vega Force 01, which was destroyed by Kizaru kicking Luffy through it. This was supposed to be our ticket off the island by using its anti-grav capabilities, and then we were going to like coup de burst after that to go even further. But now we need another option for that initial boost. And since the robot traveled all the way to Marijua in the past, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it had advanced ways of traveling like the Vega Force did. But the idea that I like even better better for the robot is that it fights Saturn. Because on one hand, it would basically be like a kaiju versus giant robot thing, which we actually got a version of at the very beginning of Egghead, when we saw the space monster face this giant robot thing. And you know, Saturn's name is based on a planet, so that ties it to a space monster a little bit, so there you go. And this would be an even deeper cut, I think, in relation to the Void Century, because Saturn fighting the robot is basically like a symbolic form of the world government versus ancient kingdom. That robot is literally from the kingdom. It's 900 years old, which honestly, Saturn might be that old as well. Now, I imagine that Saturn would still win that one eventually, but regardless, even a brief clash between the two could buy us some time to escape. It could even give us a little bit of Saturn's perspective on things, and maybe even a brief flashback where Saturn remembers this robot from before. What if this robot, or just its creator or something, is responsible for Saturn's scar? Or maybe we'll find out the robot was tied to Joy Boy's crew or something. Whatever it is, all these possibilities are why I really hope we get to see the robot clash with Saturn. So then, if neither of the robots end up being the answer
answer for how we get off the island, then who is? Well, how about the two who just showed up to basically do just that? being Dory and Brogy. As I said at the very beginning of the video, Egghead is the island of the future, and we originally met those two on the island of the past. And that gave me a really good theory, and one you may have already noticed from the thumbnail. Because remember, when we were on Little Garden, Dory and Brogy basically sent our ship flying using Hakoku sovereignty. In fact, they even sent us straight through a giant goldfish. And you know, sending our ship flying like that is kind of exactly what we were hoping to do with the Vega Force. Our plan was just to go as far as we could and then coup de burst the rest. So if Dory and Brogy can just send us as far as they possibly can, then maybe it all works the same. And obviously we would get that amazing parallel to Little Garden. Also, you know, Dory and Brogy did that to the Mary before, so now getting their chance to do it to the Sunny would be even cooler. And in fact, the other time we saw Dory and Brogy use Hakoku Sovereignty, it was also on a ship. Kid's ship. Except they kind of did that one with the intent to destroy it, so it's a little bit different. But to see us get a third Hakoku Sovereignty on someone's ship would just be so perfect. And I think it's also important to note that when they launched the Mary back then, they were also fatigued from battle, and they were also using weapons that were so old, they literally broke from that swing. So that wasn't even like their strongest form of Akoku sovereignty is basically what I'm saying. But now you know they have new weapons, apparently, and we just saw what they could do to kids' ships. So when you add in the adrenaline or desperation from the situation at Egghead, I bet that they could just send the Sunny straight through that entire armada of ships. And this would maybe highlight the fact that giants are simply the counter to a buster call almost. Because I mean, the marines have wanted to gigantify people for centuries now, and this might be a reason why. The giants are the ultimate fodder control. But you know, in order for them to even get the sunny away from the island like that, the sunny would first need to get down to them because it's currently up in the labo stratum. And with the laser system activated, it can't really get out unless we think the atom wood could survive the laser, which you know, that's an interesting discussion. But either way, I don't think the sunny wants to get hit by one of those lasers, which is a really interesting connection to Brook because last time we saw him, he had the sunny sliding uncontrollably on the frozen clouds up above. So I think where that whole thing is going is that somehow the lasers are going to get turned off, which will then allow Brooke and Lilith to almost skate the sunny straight out of the labo stratum and then down to the lower level. As for how the lasers get turned off, maybe that'll be York after like a Blackbeard pirate frees her or something, or maybe it'll just go be Edison again or something, I don't know. But the reason why the sunny landing down there makes so much sense is a few things. First being that it would just be so hype to see our ship sitting between Kizaru, Saturn, and 30,000 Marines. We've honestly had this type of scene so many different times in the story before that, that I can't imagine Oda not taking it to the next level by doing it here at Egghead. We saw this at Eni's Lobby and also post Eni's Lobby a little bit. We saw this in Whole Cake, and we even saw this a little bit in Wano before the raid started. We also saw something just like this with Roger against Shiki in the Ed War. Oda loves to have the good guy's ship up against an entire evil armada and win. And I think we're gonna need that moment here here too. Not that they beat every single marine there or anything, but just that they do manage to escape. So if Brooke can just slide the Sunny out of the Labo stratum and then over the Fabrio stratum and land like basically right at the shore, it would give us the perfect setup for Dorian Brogy to then fling us away before everything either explodes or Kizaru awakens or whatever insanity is set to happen to the island. Which may not bode well for Dorian Brogy specifically, I think. I mean, we all know the parallels between Ohara and Egghead, right? Well, remember, Saul, another giant who is not from Elbeth, actually, was kind of left behind at Ohara. And I think the very same thing may happen to Dorian Brogy. Now, Saul didn't actually die as we learned recently, so would Dorian Brogy actually survive? Well, it's possible. I could see their send-off from Egghead being a little bit like the Jinbei send-off from Whole Cake, where they're just kind of bringing up the rear, quote-unquote, and we're left wondering what really happened to them. But from a storytelling standpoint, I think this would be genius because Elbaf is already going to be a super-packed arc. I've done three completely separate videos involving Elbaf now, and I have at least one more coming. So while Dory and Brogy are awesome, it honestly makes a lot of sense to kind of leave them behind at Egghead, at least for right now. We've already spent an entire arc with them in Little Garden, so the fact they showed up to Egghead makes me think that Oda realized how much screen time they'd take in Elbeth. And by bringing them here and maybe leaving them behind, it builds a meaningful way to separate them. Because like I said, it would be amazing to get that final send off with like Egghead blowing up behind them and stuff, but then it would also be amazing to go get that reveal later on that they actually survived. Now, I could see a world where they just don't survive at all because, you know, they've been around for quite a long time and that would be extra tragic, but Oda just rarely kills people, so I'm not really sure. But now that I've talked through generally how most of the major events of the arc will go, let's go through some of the aftermath and let's start with Kuma. Because the main question with him is, does he actually end up dying as so many people have predicted, 84% of you to be precise, or does he make it 
out alive in the end? Well, this question alone is kind of tricky because he's already sort of dead. Not like 100% dead, but he's not fully himself, obviously. And to me, I think the telltale sign when he's truly dead will be when he loses his fruit powers, or maybe when he loses his 20 grams of soul specifically. Although I don't know how we'd really know that without someone explicitly telling us. But regardless, I think you guys get the point here. The question is mainly, is Kuma gonna die for good, or does he get to take Bonnie on all the adventures they spoke about? And honestly, Oda has introduced so many twists and turns in this arc already, and he's also not someone who's exactly known for killing people that often, that I'm really not that sure anymore. I was 100% convinced that he would die before, but now after all the stuff Oda's been doing, I'm like 84% convinced. Because the main thing for me, and I think a lot of us agree on this, is that Kuma needs to become conscious again at some point, just to see Bonnie and Nika. Because this whole time on Egghead, he's been sort of unresponsive, even though he's been moving. It's not like his personality is fully there. So him seeing Bonnie and Nika is something I'm absolutely waiting for. But you know, escaping alive and conscious does seem like a lot for him. Remember, he was already damaged heavily before the Reverie arc even started, because he was the Celestial Dragon Slave. And then he got attacked the entire time he was going up the red line, then got half his face blown off like Whitebeard did, and then also got his foot blown off, although we haven't really seen those drawn since he got back to Egghead. And then as soon as he did get here, he got stabbed in the back by Saturn. Plus, Vegapunk said that Kuma should be in sort of a vegetative state right now, and he is kind of trending that way it looks like. So the outlook isn't very good for our guy Kuma. And my expectation is that while he will see Nika and Bonnie, of course, he probably will die here in this arc. And honestly, part of the reason may be specifically because he sees those two. Because after he does see them, he will want to do whatever it takes to make sure they escape alive. Seeing Bonnie and Nika all well and good will probably give him some unprecedented levels of motivation. So the way I kind of see this going down is that he ends up acting like sort of a giant bomb, thus helping Egghead explode like all of Vegapunk's other labs. And the reason why Kuma specifically makes sense here is that each one of those labs was blown up by Vegapunk's friend or colleague. Punk Hazard was blown up by Caesar four years ago, Frankie blew up his lab in Baltimore two years ago, which you know they didn't have much of a connection until they met, and now it's time for Egghead, so it being done by Kuma would just be so poetic. And now sure, the Buster Call might help the island explode as well, but I don't think a bunch of cannon explosions will be on the level of what we saw in those other labs, because those were like mushroom cloud tier explosions. So I think maybe a sort of series of events here could be that the ancient giant goes and stalls Saturn, but loses, so Saturn goes after the crew, which leads Kuma to stay behind and protect them so that Dory and Brogy can send them off. I think something in that realm of things could work. And as far as what Kuma does to Saturn, I can see a few different things here. Now, one could just be that he latches onto Saturn and explodes, sort of like a Pedro and Parasparo situation, except on a much bigger scale, which maybe gives Saturn some kind of permanent damage to remember Kuma by, but still doesn't kill him. Or a second option could be that maybe Kuma awakens his fruit and does like a massive Ursa shock or something. I mean, that's basically like a giant bomb. We saw what those could do with Thriller Bark. But my favorite idea, which ties very closely to that one, is that Kuma gives Saturn a giant pain bubble. I don't think Kuma has to awaken his fruit to do this, but if he does, he would get to affect his environment with his powers. So maybe he could then take all of the pain, not just from himself, but from everyone who's still on the island. He could put all of that into one massive pain bubble and give that to Saturn. And this would hit hard for so many reasons. One, Saturn would be forced to feel the pain that he caused on everyone else. And the reason they feel this pain is mostly because he doesn't want them to study the Void Century. Now, for Kuma specifically, it's because he's a buccaneer and all their agreements and stuff, but for everyone else at Egghead, the only reason they're suffering is the Void Century research. So Kuma would be forcing Saturn to feel the pain that Saturn inflicted on him for all those years. And remember, Kuma can make the intangible tangible. And while we still have a lot to learn about the Gorosei's powers, this regeneration stuff is super sus. I mean, the summoning circle is super sus. So I wonder if using a pain bubble like this is sort of a way to bypass Saturn's regeneration. Like maybe to Saturn, a pain bubble will act as permanent pain because it's not just damage inflicted on the body, like a cut or a punch or something. But instead, it's just like the raw sense of pain in a physical obtainable form. But regardless of how that all shakes out, I do expect Kuma to be dead or at least left behind. If not for all the reasons I just said, it would also then free up his devil fruit, which I know a lot of people expect Vivi to get eventually. And you know, she's on her way to Egghead with Morgan, so that would kind of line up. But then as for Bonnie, I think her fate is going to go one of two ways. If Kuma lives, then both of them are going to go on all the adventures to the Sky Islands and wherever else they wanted to go with each other, which would be peak. 
But if Kuma dies, I think Bonnie joins the revolutionaries. Because on one hand, Dragon needs to make it up to Kuma somehow, and the very least he could do is protect Kuma's daughter after he dies. Kuma protected Luffy several times, so Dragon can do the same for Bonnie. I know a lot of people really want her to join the crew since she obviously admires Nika, but that is actually why I don't think she's going to join the crew. Luffy doesn't want people to treat him like a god ever, especially not his crewmates. They are his friends, Luffy's friends, not Nika's. But by joining Dragon, she can still liberate people and kind of live like Nika did without actually following him directly. And now this is why I still think Dragon is going to show up during this arc at some point. Or if he doesn't, it's only because he's going to go somewhere else that's equally important, which I don't know where that could possibly be. But either way, I just think Dragon is going to make his move. I know we love the Dragon looking East memes, the fraud memes and all that stuff, but this is really the time for Dragon to do something. I thought for sure he was going to be the mystery group from the end of chapter 1105, but even though it's Dorian Brogy, my hope has not wavered that Dragon will show up. Because at this point, I think it's clear that Oda is trolling us with Dragon. He's setting him up to look bad on purpose. I bet he even did the thing in 1105 on purpose, knowing that most of us would think it's Dragon. Because I mean, a few chapters ago, we did see Dragon considering where Kuma went. And Eva said he'd go to the Red Line to get some revenge, however, Kuma wouldn't do that. Now, what's ironic is Kuma did do that, but it was only because he was on his way to Egghead and the Red Line was in the way. And I think Dragon is more than smart enough to connect the dots and realize that he actually went to Egghead. Because remember, Dragon got a call from Shaka at the start of the arc that he was going to die, Luffy was said to be with Vegapunk at Egghead in the papers, and Dragon is the one who told Kuma about Vegapunk originally when looking for a cure for Sapphire Scale. So Oda is cooking something up with Dragon no matter how much we want to meme it. But I just don't know what it is. My guess for now is that if Dragon shows up, it'll just be Dragon and not all the revolutionaries. One reason is that we have so many players here as it is that introducing an entire army would be a little bit too much, I think. But there are some other good reasons for this, and the first is simply time. He is halfway across the world right now, so his only chance to get to Egghead is some kind of devil fruit. Now, Kuma's devil fruit would be helpful, but maybe Dragon has something that can kind of replicate that, like the Wind Logia fruit. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this before, you know, the main reason is because of the wind gust we saw in Logtown, but I think a reason that a lot of people don't know about is that Dragon's ship is called the Wind Grandma. Like, come on. If Dragon really does have a Wind Logia, he can probably get around the world insanely fast. And you know, on top of that, I think another reason why it'll just be Dragon and not the whole army is that when Dragon went to Logtown, he was all by himself, and that's where he met Luffy. So if he's going to meet Luffy again at Egghead, it would kind of make sense for him to still be by himself, I think. But now, what would his purpose be? I mean, I think it would have to be fighting off Saturn or Kizaru. If Oda's going to bring him here, Dragon is going to need to show out. And I mentioned earlier how the ancient robot might help hold off Saturn for a while, and Kuma might help as well. But remember, Kizaru is also a threat. If the Straw Hats are to actually escape with the Stella in tow, they're going to need all the distractions they can get right now, and Dragon is definitely on that level. And maybe what you're thinking right now is that the crew doesn't really need that much help because, you know, the Mark III's just flip sides again because Bonnie's the highest on the hierarchy, the Seraphim are still stuck in the bubbles, Dory and Brogy are out there fodderizing the Marines outside. It just doesn't seem that threatening as we stand right now. And what I would say in response to that is that you're right as long as you keep that qualifier of right now. Because we have seen the momentum shift over and over again in this arc. And I'm sure the government is going to find a way to get that upper hand again soon. I mean, for one thing, I don't think Saturn or Kizaru have even gone all out yet. Like, Kizaru hasn't awakened for sure, and it kind of feels like Saturn isn't taking this very seriously beyond the Nika or Void history stuff. I mean, he even said that if he wanted to avoid getting stabbed, he would just dodge, but he didn't. And also, as far as the Mark Threes go, this is like the millionth time we've had them shift sides, because they started on our side with Sentamaru, then they flipped because Kizaru gave them a new order after beating it. Then the Mark III's flipped again because of Atlas, but then they flipped again because of Saturn. And now they flipped another time because of Bonnie. Supposedly, this is the top of the chain, though, so theoretically it should stop here. But Oda just keeps introducing new things over and over, so I don't think that's what's going to happen. I mean, maybe at this point, Saturn just does his eye laser thing and takes all of them out. Either way, though, the point is just that the tides are going to turn again, and our crew is going to need a little more backup at some point. And who better to do that than Dragon? And then the last thing I want to cover here is 
is Vivi and Morgan's, because I think they will be most relevant towards the very end of the arc. Because if you think about it, it's not a smart move to land the World Economic Journal blimp anywhere near Egghead during a buster call, right? I mean, sure, Morgan's is coming to get the scoop, but getting in the action itself kind of seems unnecessarily risky. So I suspect that after Dorian Brogy send our crew flying from Egghead, Morgan's will go meet up with them and Vivi will then hop on the ship. Or maybe she'll hop on the ship at the very end before Dorian Brogy send the ship flying, since you know she was on the ship last time Dorian Brogy sent it flying at Little Garden, and it would be kind of nice for her to see them again because she was even there when we first heard of Elbaf. So whichever way it shakes down, I think the main thing here is that Vivi has to be on the ship before we get to Elbaf so that they all arrive together. Elbaf was set up when she was present, so I want her present when we get there. Also, Vivi is wanted by Emu right now of all people, so the safest place for her until we beat the government is gonna be with the Straw Hats. Plus, from Morgan's perspective, being an egghead for the actual incident that shocks the world just makes so much sense because A, Morgan's would love to get that scoop, and B, by virtue of us already knowing that it'll shock the world, that basically means we know it has to be reported to the world. And that almost definitely means Morgan's will know what happened because he's probably the one who shared that information. And then last, but also least, let's talk about Caribou. Because somehow, some way, he's likely to end up with the Straw Hats. Because obviously, as a lot of people have pointed out, Caribou has learned about the other two ancient weapons by virtue of being near the Straw Hats, such as Shirahoshi being Poseidon and the fact that Pluton is deep underneath Wano. And there seems to be somebody that he's relaying this information to that we don't know of yet. So through some way or another, he's going to have to learn about Uranus while being with the crew. And for a lot of reasons that I may be talking about a lot more in a video here pretty soon, Uranus has to be tied to Elbaf. And by virtue of that, Caribou's going to have to ride there with us and learn about it and stuff. So somehow he's going to get on the ship. Obviously, there's a lot of talk around Kizaru being the one who gave Luffy the food or moved him or whatever. But Caribou is a very likely and maybe even more likely option because he's given Luffy food before. And his swamp is like a different dimension to store stuff in or whatever. So there's no doubt that somehow, some way, Caribou is going to make it off with the crew. If you guys have any thoughts about these or maybe questions about things I missed or whatever, definitely leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say and maybe some of your predictions about how the arc is going to end because at this point, I think it's just about anyone's guess. And while you're down there, make sure to leave a like and subscribe because it really does wonders for the algorithm. And if you haven't had enough, maybe go ahead and watch one of these two videos that YouTube told me you might like to watch after this. But until next time, later.